Hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are joining from. Please mention in the chat what country you're from. This is Kamar, I am joining from Pakistan and will be your host for the day. Today's session is about Cloudera data platform on IBM Cloud Pack for Data. We are going to talk about IBM Cloud Pack for Data, Cloudera, and then show you a demo of the platform and its capabilities. We have some interesting and exciting uh, speakers today. We have David Fowler from Cloudera, Fawaz Siddiqui and Steve Martinelli from IBM. If at any point you have any questions, please feel free to mention them in chat. And the most important part, this session is recorded. So as soon as the live se session ends, you can see the replay. So kicking off the session, passing the floor to Fawaz Siddiqui. Thank you so much, Kamar, for such a warm welcome. And hello, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, everyone. Hope you're doing well. My name is Fawaz Siddiqui, and with me, I have Steve, uh, Steve Martellini and David Fowler. And we have a really interesting uh, session for you today. So let's talk about the agenda. Uh, so we, we have a bit of introduction about Cloud, uh, cloud Pack for Data, and we're gonna talk, uh, David's going to talk about the cloud, uh, Cloudera data platform. And then we're going to talk about how cloud era data platform for cloud pack for data adds in value to your data uh, data pipeline. And finally, Steve will be doing an, a very interesting demo and after which we'll be answering all your question and answers. So let's go towards the overviews on about, about both the technologies, right? And as we go, uh, Kamar will be posting some links for the survey. Do let us know how we are doing and it would really help us know if you like the session and what would you like to see in the future as well. So uh, let's get started for Cloud Pack for Data. Basically, it's your hub for all your data science needs. It's, it delivers the foundational platform for deploying an, uh, an information and architecture for AI on any cloud. By any cloud, we mean any cloud. It's, it can run on multiple clouds, even on premise. And basically it eliminates the, the silos and connects all your data and all your all your data like lakes together and it's all just in one platform so basically it's one platform any cloud it could be ibm cloud hyper converged private cloud systems uh, microsoft azure amazon web services google cloud and it runs on top of red hat openshift and that's how it's actually able to run on any cloud and data is basically ready for you to use churn and ready for deployment for your uh, for your use case so let's talk about the common reality these days well this picture actually captures the essence of how complex data systems can actually get there are multiple systems involved and it's very tool oriented it's very little value unnecessarily complex and costly and if you want to really visualize things right it's going to look something like this well you really don't know what's going where and how things are happening. And that really hinders all the business processes and it hinders, it, it even adds on uh, latency, right? You have so many things that happening at once where you need to decide what to use and where to use it. So uh, individual services do cost a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, issues within your data science pipeline and also your business. So that's what we are trying to de debunk here with this solution. So. Let's talk about the AI ladder, right? 
it goes on to four major steps. I'm going to talk about modernize in a while. So it's four major steps, which is basically basically collecting your data. You have to collect your data from multiple sources and make it simple and accessible for your organization. Then you need to organize that data to make sure that is business uh, business ready for any analytics that is there. You move on to the analyze phase where you build and scale AI with trust and transparency. Trust and transparency is very, very important these days. AI ethics is something very essential. And then finally, it's basic, it's the infuse area where you oper uh, operationalize AI throughout the enterprise, making sure that it is a part of your business strategy and how, how it's going to drive outcomes. Now, let's talk about the modernize. Well, once you've deployed all of these four steps or these, the, this ladder, it's time to modernize. It's to ensure that you are growing rather than just staying there. You need to ensure that you, you start unlocking a major value in the solution that you've deployed. And, and that's how, with the help of modernized solutions, you unlock the value of data for an AI in a hybrid multi-cloud world. So when you look, look at all of these four steps, which is collect, uh, organize, analyze, and infuse, it can take about two, 12 months. And at times we've seen cases without before Cloud Factor data, more than uh, more than uh, more than one and a half year. So, with automation, it basically drives time to results in 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 around six weeks. So, let's say if I tell you, hey, one of your documents is going to take around, or one of your solution is going to take around twelve months to deploy, and the other one is going to take six weeks, you need to uh, you need to accelerate really fast. You need to make sure things happen fast in your organization. So you will 100% choose six weeks, right? 12 months is a very long time. And this is where the automation happens, where in six weeks, you are ready with your pipelines. You're ready with all your, all your, all your collect stages, all your organized stages, all your analyze stages, and, and where you want to infuse. The rest is automation. It's all happening automatically. So. Let's talk about IBM Data Fabric with Cloud Pack for Data. It, it, well, it's very simple. It's very straightforward, right? It provides simplicity, right? You have multiple data sources coming in from business applications, custom applications that you've built, point of sales, user behavior, IoT, and multiple devices. And it runs on any data, on any data, any cloud, and anywhere. And the data and AI outcomes are very, very specific and very, uh, very friendly towards the organization where you get customer centricity, uh, operational agility, total quality management, continuous improvement, which is very important because you need to continuously improve and modernize your architectures, right? And finally, support critical services with all the results that you're getting. And with all of those, it's eight times faster with half the cost. So you run analytics eight times faster in a secure environment that really doesn't require copying or moving data. You're just pulling the data from the data source that you have. And for those of you joining, uh, we are talking about Cloud Pack for, uh, uh, Cloud Pack for Data and Cloudera Data Platform. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I, if you've missed the starting part, uh, don't worry, you can watch the replay as well. And Kamar will be also sharing a server link and also getting started to IBM Cloud link Make sure you sign up, make sure you do answer the survey to let us know how you're doing. So like I mentioned, uh, let's go back actually. So this is a high level architecture of all the, all the parts that are included on Cloud Pack for Data, right? So let's start from the bottom. Let me pull out a pointer really quick. There we go. So it all starts with the cloud, which you're planning to choose. This can be IBM Cloud, AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, Hyperconvert system. On top of that, it's running on Red Hat OpenShift. Now, Red Hat OpenShift takes in the core. Uh, uh, Red Hat OpenShift takes the core Cloud Pack services, which is security, administration, and operations. And then we come up to the four stages, where Collect provides you with data virtualization services, NoSQL, SQL databases, event ingestions streaming uh, analytics, Apache Spark, 
And then when you look at organize, uh, when you when it comes to organizing your data, we are talking about data transformation policies and rules, data cataloging, self-service discovery and search. When you start with analyze, it's basically all about data science, where you're getting data science and visualization, building machine learning models, model optimization, model trust and explainability. And finally, infuse, where you look at the reporting and analysis from how you've integrated your uh, your 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 solution. So business reporting, financial planning and, and analysis, cloud native AI services, um, rec tech and, uh, and financial crimes insight. Moreover, it provides you with extensible APIs, partner ecosystem, third-party solutions that are rightly integrate, integrated there. All you have to do is just click and deploy and it should be good to go. And to make things easier, there's an integrated user experience where all your, all your personas in your organization can interact with. So you have app developers, business analysts, data engineers, data stewards, data scientists, and business users all interacting on one platform when it comes to Cloud Pack for Data. Now, I would like to bring on stage David Fowler from Cloud Era to talk about the Cloud Era data platform. David, over to you. Great. Thanks, Fawaz and, and um, Steve and Kwamar and Jennifer for bringing me on to the session uh, and welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us. So, you know, it's a little bit of background. So we, you know, Cloudera has worked with IBM for some time. And as we kind of moved into some of the new things IBM is, has been doing with Cloud Pack for Data and we're doing with Cloudera Data Platform, we realized a lot of our vision really matched both with the hybrid cloud, you know, strategy and a lot of the product um, things that we were doing, a lot of the technologies that we were using under the covers, but a lot of the, the different um, ways we were approaching using those technologies. And so what I'm going to do today is give you a little bit of background on what the Cloudera, Cloudera data platform is and how it's used. And then we'll talk a little bit about how it's used with the Cloud Pack for Data as well. So as some background for the, the Cloudera data platform, CDP for short, um, we all like to use the acronyms. Um, it, it's really a full life cycle. Um, product and that, that's what we're focused on. So uh, instead of just uh, just a few kind of traditional projects that really, if you think about um, where Hadoop started and often people think about, you know, Cloudera in terms of Hadoop. Hadoop is really um, four, really now five open source projects with the, the core, um, the Hadoop file system, MapReduce, um, Yarn, and, and uh, just a couple others. But really we have extended out uh, way beyond that now. So we're now 40 plus top level Apache projects really providing the full life cycle of the platform and several hundred hundreds of sub projects underneath that to really provide a full suite, full solution set to, to whether you're starting with data out on the edge or you're starting with data in the enterprise or what a lot of our customers are telling us now is all data is stream data or all data is log data. So coming from social media, coming from other platforms. So you might have real time data coming in, you might have batch or transactional data uh, coming in from even things like machines, IoT devices, cars, um, other um, data systems. And then you need to really um, collect that data, um, transform it, manage it, um, and then start um, doing things like re reporting, um, serving it up, doing now these days, the, the machine learning, the AI, doing predictions based on that data and incorporating that into your full data life cycle, maybe out in your machines where you're trying to do something like predict the, the failure rates of machines, or you're trying to incorporate that into the actual IT um, systems and serve that up in the in the self-serve um, web applications. So really incorporating all phases of that throughout the life cycle and doing that in a secure and governance way and then meeting whatever the use cases are for your enterprise. So uh, we work really with every major vertical and have just a couple um, listed here. The predictive maintenance is one that especially in the IoT world, we were seeing a lot of a lot of people use that, um, use the platform for that. Um, supply chain optimization, that, that's key these days. We've all seen some of the, the issues going on with the supply chain out there across the world and, and its impact that, that's happening. So that, that's a key area. Um, and really across all of the, the, the industries and, and uh, customers, you know, things like dashboards, real-time dashboards 
providing real-time insights to wh whether that's to your customers or to your um, users with within your company. And those um, customers can be users within your, your company as well. So whether it's batch, whether it's real-time dashboards, uh, the, the whatever the latency, whatever the throughput, at really any volume, that, that's really our goal is to meet that kind of a, a use case and platform. So next slide, please. So to, a little bit of background on where kind of this has come from, where we came from and, and uh, a lot of the industry as well. So over on the left, we've got the traditional cluster, the big data clusters where you have really compute the state information, things like your um, uh, maybe your security policies, your um, table definitions, um, that kind of state information that whether your compute is running or not running, you need that that information around. And then storage, being able to have storage that can scale to meet your demands. And that could be <clears throat> either a, a single application, a couple applications, or a data lake where you're having lots of applications. So that's the traditional model. And we still have a lot of people using that and it works pretty well um, it, and, and uh, runs on-prem. Uh, you, you could also run that in a virtualized environment. So whether it's um, physical servers or virtualized, um, that works. And then as we look over on the right, then what uh, people, as they moved into the cloud, um, public cloud environments, uh, in IAS infrastructure, um, services, the, the kind of first cut of moving to the cloud and still what some vendors are doing is they're just moving that compute and the storage over into the public cloud. So running it on virtual machines, running your, your compute workloads on virtual machines and using object storage on there. But the one of the value props and the key tenancy of the public cloud is that your compute is um, on demand and variable comes and goes based on the, the workloads. And so when you're doing that, you know, the state information becomes a problem um, if you don't maintain that as your compute goes down or, you know, is, is shut down in the, in the public cloud, then often if that um, state is stored in the compute, then you lose that information and that can be a major problem. That also goes to things like security policy, your audit information. So when you have compliance and governance um, requirements, whether that's um, GDPR, the payment card industry, PCI standard, you know, that, that information is just critical and just basically required for those industries to run. So what we've done is we've created a cloud optimized environment where we have the state always on and the compute can come and go, be scaled up and scaled down on demand and make use of, of the object storage and integrate that in with the cloud native um, capabilities that are baked into that object store and the compute services. So the security in a cloud native environment is really built around those storage and the the um, the the uh, user that's logging into the cloud native service um, along with that storage. So you need to be fully integrated in with that security model that, that's part of that um, public cloud. So that's key. Um, really having this type of environment with that state information is absolutely a requirement really to run uh, the correctly and run in a compliant manner and scale up and down in the public cloud. So next slide, please. So what is that state information? So let's drill into that a little bit because that that's a key um, foundational part of really running in the public cloud and making it run well and meet those compliance requirements. So data catalog is one, that's where you have all your data sets um, defined. Um, so you know where the, whether you're having structured or unstructured and you have uh, a data steward that can really have insight into that, you know, where all those assets are and who's using those assets as things are changing, um, being able to um, use that and create policies, th things like, um, personally identifiable information policies or you know, top secret policies if you're in the government space. So all those kind of things are key in the data catalog space. And then as we look at the schema space, you know, as you're, you're creating tables and definitions, you need to have that, uh, the ability to capture those definitions and really um, 
make use of those definitions, those schema definitions, really on any of the different types of storage mechanisms that, that you're using within your in your environment, and be able to move that, you know, from public cloud to private cloud, and have consistency across both of those for a hybrid cloud environment. And the same thing for security. So security is just fundamentally a, a key requirement. Uh, that, that people need to to start with really from the beginning and not think of it as an afterthought, you know, after they develop the application, then worry about security. It really needs to be um, from the from the very beginning, uh, something that you incorporate into your design. And that needs to in, in, in include things like as well as um, perimeter security and uh, access um, uh, authentication and authorization. So you need to have security policies and those policies need to be both um, role-based and, and data-based that, that you can apply to uh, and have things like full stack um, encryption and, and key management that works both for data over the wire and then data at rest or data as it lands somewhere. So that, that needs to be consistent across all, all of that. And then governance is key. So auditing, being able to have lineage and track when changes were made in any of those um, components in any of the metadata areas, any of the, the usage, um, and then uh, incorporate that across the full platform. So not just across a couple of the components, but have a unified governance capability that, that works across all of them. And that's one thing we've worked on. As we mentioned, we, you know, we had a lot of shared vision with IBM so that the governance was key and some of the integration we've done with things like Watson Knowledge Catalog and the SDX layer is absolutely key to uh, both what, what we thought made just core sense from the beginning and what we want to do over time is just in, increase that um, between the two platforms. And then being able to replicate data, whether it's between cloud vendors, often customers now have requirements to, to run on multiple clouds for um, maybe for high availability or for um, redundancy in, in case of failures, um, but also um, being able to do that between on-prem and in the cloud. So while there are some cloud customers that'll run on just one or the other, what we found is, especially in the larger customers and ones that have compliance requirements, that they have a mix. They have both on-prem and in the cloud and they need a very consistent um, platform that they can run the same type of workloads or even the exact same workloads, both on-prem in the cloud, have the same security policies, have the same governance capabilities that they can apply and track um, things both in that hybrid cloud environment on-prem and in the cloud. Uh, so next slide, please. So here are our form factors for the, the hybrid cloud environment. So over on the left, the traditional um, CDP private cloud base is the traditional cluster, the installable software that can run either on bare metal or on virtual machines and is typically running with HDFS. That can be the, the default HDFS we provide or the spectrum scale um, storage from IBM providing the, the HDFS. We've also done that integration work with IBM uh, where, where they, uh, they provide a lot of value beyond just HDFS with, with spectrum scale. Um, and so HDFS is one component in spectrum scale, and then it provides a lot of geo um, redundancy capabilities, a lot of other ingest mechanisms with other multi-protocol support um, with, with spectrum scale. So a lot of uh, great things in that combination as well. So you can use the traditional HDFS or the spectrum scale. And then as we move into the middle, what we see really moving forward as a key um, foundational technology and share that with that vision with IBM is really the the Kubernetes and the container model where um, you're starting to run these compute services or are running these compute services in that container model on Kubernetes on OpenShift and scaling that up and down on demand um, in that form factor to meet uh, whatever the the type of um, compute requirements are that you have and, and really getting rid of some of the maybe noisy neighbor and some of the other issues that, that you might have with the, the kind of traditional data lake um, cluster. So we have moved some of the, the main core set of services into that um, container and Kubernetes orchestrated model running on OpenShift. And then we you can use either the, the traditional HDFS as the storage or uh, object store, we have a software defined object store called Ozone and use that with, with those um, containers as well. 
And then for public cloud, we run that those same um, that same concept of running in the containers on Kubernetes on uh, AWS Azure and, and Google Cloud Platform. We call those the the um, data services experiences when you're running in containers. Uh, so you're running that service, whether it's a SQL service, a data warehousing uh, around the, the SQL space running in a container um, and doing that, whether you're, you need to meet low latency, whether you need to meet batch reporting type requirements, really scale up and scale down to meet any of those. And then you might have data engineering where you're running Spark workloads uh, for different um, either transformational or other uh, real-time uh, type workloads. And then we have machine learning capabilities um, there as well within that, that space. And then have another, a number of other um, streaming uh, type workloads that will be coming out here in the next um, six months to year as well in that platform. So we run that all in in uh, that, a common platform that really th those services are shared, uh, those components and the, the SDX layer, as we talked about um, prior, is shared between all those form factors and between the, the on-prem and the, the public cloud environments. So next slide, please. So why, and go ahead and build that out uh, all the way if you would, please. So why run in that, in the, um, the, the container and the Kubernetes environment instead of traditional cluster? And why we see that is really where the direction that a, a lot of workloads are headed. So one is um, workload isolation. So when you're running the traditional kind of cluster, a lot of people are we're setting up da data lakes and running multiple applications, um, multiple tenant in type environments, even uh, in, in that environment. And that, that works pretty well. Uh, there are some, some scheduling capabilities, but there, there is some, some problems. And some of these are things like the noisy neighbors that can maybe eat up the compute um, or even some of the storage um, in that data lake and impact some of the other services. Um, being able to upgrade that data lake uh, uh, when you need it to for your particular applications and then meet modern uh, standards with the, these containers that can do a better job of multi-tenant type environments. So meeting some of the, the, the more common requirements that, that we're seeing today for multi-tenant um, capabilities. And then simplified onboarding. So scale up and scale on, on demand uh, with push button type provisioning and um, be able to have really simplified user faces that work um, for that kind of scale up and scale on demand uh, type workloads and then better infrastructure utilization. So uh, instead of having some workloads that are running all the time and, and being underutilized as far as the workload, you can really make the most efficient use of your resources and scale up and scale down uh, for those both on-prem and in, in the cloud, and then make the, the most um, advantageous use of your both compute and, and um, memory and, and those type of uh, resources. And then, have the, a shared Kubernetes environment for those different um, experiences that, that are running on a single um, OpenShift um, platform, the, the Kubernetes platform for on-prem, and then be able to do things like set quotas that um, can be uh, minimums and max you know, per tenant within the, that environment. So those are all key things that we see the uh, kind of moving forward with now being able to, to deploy these data service experiences in those container and Kubernetes environments. So next slide, please. So here um, is just showing you an example of um, the hybrid environment where we have the um, both the, the on-prem uh, with either the traditional base cluster or the, the containers running on Kubernetes. Uh, so you have choices of both of those. And then the public cloud and where we're sharing things like the SDX, those um, table definitions, the metadata informations, your security policies, your audit information. So you can move those workloads from one to the other um, or have the same, same type of workloads running uh, in, in both of those environments and share the data catalog, maybe replicate. An example would be you might burst one, uh, if, if you maybe you're, you have month end or year end processing and you don't have enough capacity on your on-prem, you can burst that up, up into the cloud and have those same definitions, the same security policies, the same audit, the same definition, the same governance 
um, that you're leveraging both on-prem and, and in the cloud as, as you're running the, uh, either those workloads, either bursting to the cloud or running portions of them in one place or the other. So fully hybrid uh, working in, in both uh, on-prem and, and public cloud. Uh, next slide, please. So why um, Cloudera Data Platform and IBM Cloud Pack for Data? As have you seen a little bit, we share a lot of the, a lot of the core technologies like OpenShift, a lot of the vision of running on a, a Kubernetes and a container-based platform, a lot of the same vision with things like um, the Watson Knowledge Catalog and governance. But some here's some of the key value propositions. So you really extend the power of of the an individual platform with two, and especially when they share a lot of the same a common technologies, a lot of the same vision, same vision, and are unified together. Um, that, that really um, makes the, the platform, you know, one plus one equals three instead of uh, just two, uh, kind of a scenario. And it really saves you on money instead of spending a lot of time integrating the platform uh, and and having different um, desperate type of environments. Uh, when you share a lot of the same technologies and the same vision, it really um, saves a lot on, on time and money uh, implementing the, those solutions together and better integrated. So we have done testing uh, as well as sharing the vision. We've, we've actually tested these platforms running together and have the advantages of, of scaling them out um, and using together. Uh, so next slide, please. So here's a, a sample architecture slide of running a joint solution set, kind of an example reference architecture that a customer might use when they're installing at it their, their environment. And they may have some different um, components that they use, but here's kind of a, 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 an initial kind of reference architecture common set to start with. So you can see as, you're, whether, as you move through the different phases, life cycle and how people would use the, the platform, whether you're collecting data and, um, uh, you're going to connect different type of data sources that, that might be um, whether those are real-time clickstream, real-time IoT, you know, web logs that are coming in, uh, traditional IT systems. Uh, we've got the Cloudera components for the Cloudera data warehouse and the different types of streaming. Uh, some of the streaming can be real-time. Some of it can be have low latency requirements. Some of it can have really high volume requirements. Some of it can need to connect to a lot of different sources. So you need to have the capabilities to stream from all different types of uh, use cases and then connect to a, a wide variety of sources. So they're using data stage and its connectors to connect to a, a lot of different um, data sources and then organize and transform that data um, in a manner that is needed for your, whether it's your data warehouse or whatever the, uh, if you're going to land it in maybe DB2 or some other um, uh, um, data store where you're going to run your applications from, that's absolutely key. And then um, the have the, the um, whether it was the DB2 and then have that governance on the, on the bottom. So things like the Watson Knowledge Catalog integrated in with the Cloudera SDX and then have that stored in the scalable storage um, from uh, the HDFS and, and IBM cloud storage that you might be using with as part of the ingest um, phase or landing it in that and then making use of it within the DB2 or Big SQL um, framework. And then um, being able to use whatever this, the appropriate SQL engine that um, uh, you need to uh, leverage whether it's you're doing real-time dashboards or you, whether you're doing batch type reporting, uh, have, have a, a choice of what is the best SQL engine that really meets whatever your scalability and real-time requirements are. And then, um, as we mentioned now, these days often incorporating the AI and machine learning into the full life cycle with security and then feeding that back into any of those different stages within that life cycle is just absolutely key. So we have spent time you know, testing this and running it together and making sure the Cloud Pack for Data and CDP work together uh, and really provide, as I mentioned, that, that one plus one equals three type of environment with to, to meet a really broad range of, of what use cases and, and customer requirements are that, that you might run into and meet that in a, in a secure and, and governed um, type of world. So I think that's it for me. So uh, I'll see if the next stage, yeah, demo I think is 
next. So I'll pass it over to Steve. Thanks, David. I'm just double checking. I am appropriately zoomed in here. All right. Um, I think I'm good to go. Let's uh, let's get started here. All right. So um, let me just uh, share my screen really quick here. Uh, share screen. All right. I'm assuming you can see the screen. Yep. Okay. All right. So, um, all right. So about the little demo here, what do we got? Um, so I'm going to try and give a whistle stop tour of all things kind of Cloudera data platform and Cloud Factor data and um, try to be as hands on as possible. I've got a lot of things I want to cover. I don't think I'm going to get a chance to cover them all, but we'll see what we can do here. Some things I've already done and preceded, uh, like I've already created connections here from Cloud Pack for Data to Cloudera. So it's going to speed things up a little bit. All right. So the first thing I want to do is um, show you our Cloudera, man our Cloudera Data Platform instance. And here we have Cloudera Manager. It's version uh, 744 for Cloudera Manager. And Cloudera Runtime is 717. I think these are both the most recent versions. Uh, David can clarify if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure they're the most recent ones. Yep, those are the current ones. Yeah. And, uh, oh, yeah, feel free to chime in, uh, David or uh, Fawaz. And uh, we actually installed this uh, using the Ansible playbooks that are provided. I believe they're open sourced uh, that David and his team provided. And the they're installed on, uh, it says, eight, um, eight different hosts here. These hosts are on um, IBM Cloud. Um, you know, pretty pretty beefy machines here, about 32 B CPU and uh, 120 uh, gigs of RAM. And uh, going back here, you can see what we actually have on the cluster. And they're running uh, CentOS. And you can see what we have on the cluster. We've got pretty much most of the services on here with, uh, you know, Hive and Impala and HDFS being the the most popular or most used ones. I'm hoping I can get a chance to talk about Kafka and SQL Stream Builder. I find those really cool and it kind of goes into what David was talking about where you're seeing more more, more and more data is coming from, you know, IoT type devices and streaming is becoming a really important use case. All right, and just to show folks, here's our Cloud Pack for Data instance. I've got a bunch of the tabs already loaded because I'm hoping to, sh hoping to go through the different tabs here, um, like the connection, the projects, uh, data sources for data virtualization, all that fun stuff. But first, we're going to go and play around with uh, my Cloudera instance. So I'm going to pop over here. And is this sufficiently zoomed in, I hope? Um, all right. So this is my uh, Cloudera instance, uh, one of my hosts. I'm just going to log into it and uh, use Kerberos to authenticate. Uh, and I'm going to do a, you can see locally, I've got uh, one file and a few CSV files on here, uh, products, retailers, and those two I'm going to be playing with. If we do a HDFS, DFS, LS, and look at uh, what I've got allocated on my user over here, you can see we've just got the products uh, CSV file. And I want to, let's go ahead and add that retailer CSV file in there. So let's do a head on the retailers, see what's in there. Um, you can see there's no column headers on here. It's just, you know, this is the data. I believe it's a store number, um, you know, the name, location, phone number, contact information, all that fun stuff. So let's go and put that into HDFS. And I kind of scheduled this, I kind of made this demo so that it really kind of tells the story of the whole thing uh, from start to finish. And I apologize if this is, you know, maybe a little too simple for folks uh, in, in the beginning, but hopefully it gets into some interesting parts uh, near the end um, very soon. So I'm, I've got a few commands here just because I don't want to screw them up. And uh, there we go. So let's go ahead and put that CSV file in the, into HDFS. List on there, make sure it's there. Great. And there's our retailers has been added there. 
And it's actually one really nice feature about uh, Cloudera Manager. Uh, if you click on HDFS, uh, there's a little file browser option here. And um, you can see over here the uh, user and I uh, click on Steve Mar over here and you can see our file was just added there on 1026. So that looks good. All right, so that's the HDFS part. Now we need to add it to Hive. Now, the easiest way to integrate, to work with Hive, I've noticed is to run the VLINE application. I've already authenticated with Kerberos, so I shouldn't need to, um, shouldn't need to provide a username and password, but I will need to provide a connection string. But no new username, no password, should just go. All right, we're there. I can't think we're here right now, but you can, uh, I wish it was uh, at the top there. So let's run show databases and see what we've got there. We've got five different databases on here. And I'm going to use go data. And let's do show tables. Put a product table in there. Like I said, I kind of did some of this work beforehand. But now we want to add that retailers uh, table, if you recall. Now to do that, let's go in. I'm going to look at my cheat sheet over here. I've got a uh, bit of a DDL here to create a table. Let's paste that in there. And rerun our command to show the tables. And then we've got a uh, retailers table. And it, all that did was, um, you can see here, it just you know create a table, you know give the column names some types, and we're saying that the um, it's going to be the data is going to be delimited by a comma. All right. Now that we've done that though, but you can do uh, you know select star from retailers, you're not going to get much. You know, it hasn't actually loaded the data, which is created an empty table. Just gives us the headers. So what we want to do is uh, run a command here to load the data from HDFS. You can see we're just pointing to the location that I stored it in. And let's do a select data, but let's limit it to three because I don't want to flood the screen. There you go. Let's see one entry, two entries, three entries. And that's kind of the gist of our, um, that's going to be what's in our Hive database. And David, feel free to clarify me on this one here, but in Paul, Impala versus Hive. Why don't you talk about that for two minutes? I get this question all the time. You're the cloud air expert. You know, clarify this one for me. You can use Impala or Hive to access the data here, right? Yeah, they both use the Hive Metastore and share, a, you know, the a common, you know, area for table definitions and that kind of thing. And you can, uh, you know, use one or the other or even combine both in, in some use cases, but in general, you'll, you'll kind of pick one or the other. So mm -hmm. uh, the traditionally Hive is used for things like reporting and Impala more for like real-time dashboards. So the one of the differences is, is Hive, excuse me, Impala runs is an in-memory SQL um, processing engine. So that's why it has that low latency, you know, real-time dashboard type requirement where Hive can do a much better job with things like full table scans and where, where you're maybe creating a report and you're scanning through really large volumes of data. So Hive more recently has added ACID support um, so that, and we are moving some of that ACID capability into, um, into uh, Impala as well. Uh, so some of that, that is shared and our kind of vision in the future is what we call unified analytics. So you wouldn't even have to decide which one you're gonna use. You could create a common table definition and then make use of whichever one you want um, gotcha. for the, the type of processing. So that's where it's headed. Right now you kind of pick one or the other, but in the future you'll, you'll be able to create a table and just decide which, yeah, you know, as, you, as you create your query plan, it'll pick one or the other based on what the, the type of query is that you're, that you're running uh, for those two. Yeah, thank you uh, sure. for the clarification there. I feel like that's always a common question I get. Yeah. Um, Okay, so you can see on Cloud Pack for Data now, we've got this screen here. Let me actually duplicate that. Um, where I've already set up a bunch of connections here. Um, you know, I either use the generic JDBC type. Um, let me actually pop that open. Um, there we go, new connection. And with uh, Cloud Pack for Data, you can connect to, you know, as Fawaz kind of alluded to, uh, you can connect to plenty of different uh, sources for your data, whether it could be 
even an object storage service like S3, a DB2 database, Oracle, MySQL, or in our case, a bunch of different cloud areas. Hey, uh, Steve, I'm really sorry for interrupting you. Can you just zoom in? Because people can't really see the cloud right. pack for data platform. 125% sure. would be good. Yeah, amazing. Awesome. Sounds good. Thank you. Thanks. Sorry about that. Uh, I, I think I did okay with the terminal, but not with the browser. My bad. Um, but yeah, like I was saying, with uh, Cloud Pack for Data, you can connect to a whole bunch of different sources. Uh, you know, we've got here, um, uh, down there was Impala. Um, and we can see HDFS and Hive here. Or I, I actually like to do the just the generic JDBC um, over here. And this is just one example of uh, the connections that you can make. I already made these. I want to save a little bit of time here. So you can see the generic JDBC, the Impala, Hive one. Um, let's go and take a look at the Hive one. And um, I think it's worth showing Knox, David. Let's see. I'm sure if you have enough time. So I, th I think Knox gives you a lot of flexibility. It's a gateway service for you know being able to connect different uh, endpoints together and meet really any kind of security requirements. So I think it's a great great thing to All show. Right. Or at least Let's oh. let's go for it. Hold up. Hold on one second. Let me pop open Knox. Let me make this a little bit bigger too. All right, Knox. As David said, uh, Knox is gateway service. Let's go ahead and log in here. Type that incorrectly. Yeah, there we go. And with Knox, um, you can see you can access all these different services over here. Through a common, um, just through a common gateway. A lot of these services, um, if you've ever, a lot of th these services use Kerberos, and if you've ever, if you've ever had the pleasure of using Kerberos, you know configuring the client side is not that easy. So what goes on with Knox is that it's going to take care of that client side configuration for you, and then you can connect with a, you know more traditional username, password, basic auth um, connection. Uh, to Knox, and then it'll forward the request to the right service. So you can see here our Hive, um, our Hive services. Uh, you, we have the JWC written out over there, and just so you know, showing that we're not cheating anything here. I'll copy and paste that here. We can compare it to what I have. And you can see it's the right host name, port, SSL is one or true, transport mode, path. It all kind of lines up. Go ahead and test this, make sure it works. If it doesn't work, this demo is gonna go really poorly. So <laughs> uh, fingers crossed. There we go. All right, green is good. Looks like the demo gods are with us today. <laughs> oh, don't you oh you just jinxed it a lot. How could you? Um, okay, so now that we you know we seeded our data in Cloud Era, we've got a connection established. Uh, now let's go and you know do something useful with it. Let's create a new project here uh, in, in uh, IBM Cloud Pack for Data. Let's create an empty project. Um, oh, uh, there we go. Um, let's call it uh, Cloud Era IBM Demo. And let's just create that really quickly. Hey, now, Steve, um, yeah. as you are as you're creating the project, we have a really interesting question. Sure. So the question is, um, how does uh, how do does the CML and uh, Watson Studio work together? Oh, for the Cloudera machine learning and Watson Studio. Yeah. Yeah, I wasn't actually going to cover that today because there's so much to cover. Uh, but basically, there's a service um, that you can install called um, Execution Engine on on both sides, on the Cloudera side and the um, and the uh, cloud pack on, on the cloud pack for data side, it's called uh, Hadoop Execution Engine. And what that does is uh, it uses, um, I believe, it uses Apache Livy, creates a Livy service uh, so that the two can talk. So you know, if you are creating a Jupyter notebook in cloud pack for data, you can actually use some of the Spark services that are on the Cloudera side. Um, Sounds good. Thank you. Good question. And one quick thing before I go and look at this project and import the connections because that's the next step. Actually, let's do that right now. Hold on. Let's add to the project. Let's add the connection. Now let's add, uh, we can hit from platform. 
and we can select. Oh, come on, from platform. And let's. We have add, another question as you're creating the connection. Sure. Uh, uh, as a as a user, can you use these connections? This is by Tor One on Twitter. As a user, Twitter. can you use these connections? It, was that the question? As a user, can you use these connections? Yeah. Um, might have to dig a little at the answer there, but uh, yeah, I mean, we want to import them into projects like I'm doing right now, and from there you can start import. You can start looking at the data from Cloud Factor data, so um, you can then uh, it, it use tools like Data Refinery or Watch Knowledge Studio, um, Watch Knowledge Catalog, or Watson Studio to start looking at that data. All right, sounds more. good. Thank you, Steve. No problem. Uh, of course, everyone saves the questions for the demo. Um, I like it. So one other thing I want to import, um, let's just say one more connection in here. Uh, where is it? Map on the platform again. And let's do, uh, let's do, uh, there we go, DB2. So on Cloud Pack for Data, you can also create your own database. And uh, I've done that um, before the call. And I'll show it to you right now. Let's go and pop over here. So this is my DB2 instance. Um, it's called DB2 Warehouse. It's on this actual cluster, the same cluster that Cloud Pack for Data is on. You can see it's got one table, um, one schema. It's kind of like a equivalent to like the database, um, and it's called Go Data. And within Go Data, I have a table in here called. Come on, load up. Uh, there we go. I have a table called Sales, and we're just going to give you a quick preview of the data here. And this Go, this is meant to show that you know you can have data in two different spots. And, and they're related. So we have sales data and we have um, you know, data about the products, data about the retailers. This is all fictitious data about a made up company that sells you know, sporting goods. And here we can view the data. It's got 500,000 rows or something. And um, you know, it's got a retailer code, product number, you know, uh, revenue, all that fun stuff. And that's uh, kind of meant to show that it's transactional data. So that's our fun uh, DB2 bit here. And I'm going to go back to um, my project here where I'm importing a bunch of different assets. And you can see here I've got uh, DB2 and Hive. OK, now let's go to, actually, I'm going to add one more connection. And we're going to add, actually, no, we don't need to do that. My bad. Let's cancel. Let's go and start showing um, data refinery. So let's see that. Cloud Park for Data can actually view this data, view the data in Hive. So if you're following along, we've got data in Hive about products and retailers, and we've got data in DB2 uh, about sales information. So let's go and add a, um, let's say, a data refinery flow. And data refinery is one of the services that's on Cloud Pack for Data. It allows you to shape your data. And of course, I'm getting a call during the demo. That's always fun. Uh, there we go. And from here, we can view our connections. We'll click on Hive. And we're going to click on Go Data. And if you recall, we had retailers. And let's click on that. Let's add it. And I apologize if that went too fast. I should be slowing down a little bit more. Uh, but what happens is here is uh, data refinery is up and running. And here we can see all the data. And this was, if you recall, the same data that we were viewing in uh, that we uploaded to Hive. You know, uh, we have a department store in Switzerland over here, 1137. That's the same one, department store Switzerland, 1137. And if you flip through, you can see the different uh, postal code, contact information, all that fun stuff. This does take a few minutes to kind of feed up. So now yeah, Fawaz would be a great time for a question. Well, uh, we answered all the questions, but hey, um, if anyone has a question, feel free to comment and do uh, let us know how you're doing. Um, 
um, uh, one of my colleagues will be sharing the link. Uh, that, there it is right on the screen. So you can go to cp4d cpd-survey and uh, you can go ahead and, and start sharing your comments there. Let us know on what you want to see in the future and what do you like about this session. And, and yeah, uh, you know, thank, uh, th this has been very interesting. So just for a recap, I think, oh, wait, I think the instance is ready. So yeah. Steve, you want to continue? You don't right. have to call for time anymore. Don't worry, we're good. <laughs> uh, here's our, uh, you can see that the data did load up. It's, it takes a sampling of the data, not the whole thing here, but you can see the profile here. Uh, it'll go through each column name and kind of give you a frequency of how often some values come up minimum length, maximum length, uh, mean. Um, this gets a lot more meaningful when it's numbers rather than, you know, postal codes or sites. Um, but then at the same time, also, you can hit visualization. You can get some pretty cool visualizations here, too. Uh, as soon as it loads, uh, you know, we'll just do something really quickly like country and just visualize that data and it should come up. You know, here's a breakdown of all the data. So in about like, you know, two clicks, I managed to create a pretty cool visualization about our data. So I like it. It's a pretty cool tool. Now, uh, one thing with data refineries, you can actually shape some of the data. If you hit operation, you can see the types of operations you can do. You can do some basic math. You can rename columns, um, rename values, uh, substitute some text, calculate a whole bunch of other fun values, some other math. Um, but I don't want to do anything too complicated. So what I'm actually going to do is uh, pick on this province or state. I don't like that it's empty. Some of them, uh, some of them are empty here. So I'm, I'm just going to do something crazy. I'm just going to, just going to remove that whole column. Let's just drop it. There we go. It's, it's dropped. I don't like it. And let's, uh, let's save this. Save and create a new job. So. Here we go. And now what this is going to do is it's, uh, as you can imagine, as the name implies, it's going to first save the data into our project. Uh, let's say um, data refinery. Very job. And the input was from our connection. And from our hive connection, the output's going to be there. Let's hit next schedule you can run this as often as you'd like so if you keep getting new data you can keep reshaping it if you like and here we can review and create and let's just go ahead and create and run the job and when it's done it'll be added to our project as a uh, data asset um, so over here within our project you'll see something eventually um, maybe we'll jump to something else but um, in a few minutes uh, we'll come back here and as a data asset you'll see a, uh, and we can view it, you'll see the data is available, that sampling of data is available. And when we click on it, it's gonna say, uh, it's not gonna have that province uh, or province or state um, column. All right, so that's data refinery. Now let's uh, switch gears over to, uh, let's pick on Watson Knowledge Catalog now. Watson Knowledge Catalog is another service. And uh, what it does is uh, you can see here, uh, lets you kind of find information about the data that you have. So let's add a connection here. Okay, I'm trying to remember, I think, let's use the Impala one just to be a little bit different. And because as David said, you can use kind of either connection here. Hey, and, um, yeah. Steve, uh, sorry, uh, Steve, yeah. So we have a question since you mentioned Impala. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, the question is, do we need to have Knox installed in Cloud or a Hadoop platform in order to be able to create a Hive slash Impala connection from Cloud Pack for data? Uh, no, but it does make your life easier. Uh, I've, you know, it's actually funny. I was just actually talking to a customer yesterday about this. Um, and I think overwhelmingly, I think most folks are going to be using uh, Knox um, in a, like a production environment. Um, and that's just to, sorry, I'm just kind of trying to do this at the same time. Uh, I think uh, just cause this is going to take a while to run. Uh, yeah. So I think you, you can certainly use uh, non, 
you can certainly use the Cloudera Impala connection and connect directly to Impala. Uh, depending on how you have your Impala set up, you're either going to have to supply the Kerberos related artifacts like uh, Curb5 config file or key tabs, or you can, uh, or maybe if you have it set up using just username and password, you can do that too. Uh, I like recommending Nox. I think most production environments are going to be using Nox against some LDAP or Active Directory. That, um, and that's why I, I suggest uh, going through Nox. I think it makes it a lot easier. Um, All right, sounds good. Like we'll let good. you continue with the demo. We do have some questions upcoming, but uh, we want to finish the demo and then we'll take it forward from there. Sure, I think this is actually going to take some time to process. So fire up another one. Unless All right, David so, said anything that he wanted to say about the last question. But okay, let's go for another one. All right. So I'll take this one. So if you wanted to run uh, if you wanted to schedule running data refinery jobs, is there a best practice best practice for the uh, for the frequency? Well, it really depends on what type of data are you dealing with. Uh, basically if it is live uh, live data which is coming in real time. You want to set up something that is very frequent in terms of churning the data and, and cleaning the data according to that. If there is something that is, let's say, over a period of time, let's say maybe you are getting your data in batches in weeks or maybe in days, then, uh, then basically you need to run it based on that. So the best practice is basically to make sure that it, the frequency of those jobs actually are towards your your use case right if it's again like i mentioned if it's very frequent you need to run the job frequently and you ensure that it's uh, it's run in a in a in a proper way um mm -hmm. we have another question uh so, uh so i think all three of us will be on this <laughs> what can, uh, we, can we sorry yeah. can we pause that question just for a minute because my thing just finished here and i know it's good it, virtualization will take a little while all right sounds um, good I just want to actually show the output of Watson Knowledge Catalog. And you can see here uh, it's discovered a whole bunch of different columns about our data. Here's our retailer data. You know, see the column names on there. And it kind of scores the quality of this. How often is there a missing field? Uh, does it kind of line up with what was expected? And it wants to assign a data class on here. Uh, it says person name, city, date. Um, and then here you can kind of share this kind of like schema or catalog with other folks in your cloud pack for data environment uh, so here's kind of the output of what you would kind of see for a watson knowledge catalog it can go much more in depth but i want to go on to the next one here which is data virtualization because i think that's really cool and that also takes a little bit of time to do so just sit tight with that question for a while it's just gonna be a minute here uh, for data virtualization, you can see here, um, you know, ignore the fact that it says inactive, they're actually active. Um, you know, I've already got three different sources on here. Now, what data virtualization does is if you have two different sources of data, you can actually merge them together, sort of, I use that term loosely, uh, merge them together and create a single unified view and place that into a project. So you can see here, I've got three different connections. Uh, one, our DB2 sales data on Cloud Pack for Data. Another one, uh, Impala connection. Another one about Hive. Now, I've already imported these data sources. I'm going to go ahead and hit uh, Virtualize. Now, let's take a quick look here. And uh, you can actually search through this and see the kind of data um, and, and see which data that you want to add and try and merge together. Let's give it a second here. This is not really pretty quick. And uh, really cool, I just found out that you can actually virtualize data that's in a cloud object storage as well. So if it's an S3 or IBM Cloud or um, uh, the Microsoft alternative there, Microsoft Azure alternative, it's also, uh, you're, you're also able to virtualize that too. So here's our sales table, which we had a small preview of before. And let's go to the retailer's table. If I spell it correctly, that would help. There we go. And you can see it's available uh, through Hive or Impala. So we're just going to click Impala this time. And I will select it, go to the project that we created, Clutter IBM Demo. And yeah, I think that's, uh, let's just go with the defaults there. 
let's choose to virtualize this. All right. Um, okay, question for us. All right, so this question, it's an interesting one. I think all of us will be jumping on this. Uh, so the question is, suppose an organization plans migrating to microservices architecture from mo monolithic post creating these database connection. Mm -hmm. What should be the approach? This is by Nitish. Uh, if you're going from, well, uh, I, I think the, the easy answer here is kind of use the strangler pattern. Uh, isn't that the uh, the recommended way where you kind of try and piece off little portions at a time and slowly turn off? You know, you can create a small microservice for, you know, customer lookup. And you can turn off that bit on your monolithic app and reroute the request there and kind of slowly do it piecemeal, uh, one piece at a time until you've hopefully, um, you know, re-architected things. I think no, I'll I'll add, oh, yeah, go ahead, David. Yeah, I'll add kind of my two cents worth in, in there a little bit too. So the, uh, you know, the traditional from the, coming from the Hadoop world, say you were running Impala or Hive, maybe in the traditional cluster and you're scaling that up. That's what we, we kind of think of as the, as the monolithic, you know, environment running that traditional cluster. We're really running on OpenShift, running in the container model is that microservice model. So what we're doing is really providing that same service, but having it be able to scale up and scale down. So moving, you know, you're, you're essentially moving your compute instead of running it in the monolithic environment, you're moving the compute with that same ability to have the same table different definition, the same security model, but move the compute layer over into that microservice model and be able to leverage that on-demand scale up, scale down that people are really expecting from the cloud world with a microservice type model. So that that's absolutely a key kind of vision of what, what we see happening and why we're doing this with the, the running on OpenShift and moving over into that, that type of a com compute model. Yeah, and I'll just add two more cents and make it a four. <laughs> so, uh, basically, it's like a very phased approach. You need to analyze on what can still reside on your monolithic application and then start forwarding those components one by one, like Steve said. And then you need to pose, move forward to modernizing the architecture further to ensure that all your services. So during this migration phase, what you need, really need to take care of is minimal, minimal disturbing and disturbances towards your existing services and your customers. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. some, and that's why we are using a parades approach. Yeah. Right. Well, uh, all right. It looks like my data has been uh, virtualized. So I'm going to go ahead and click view my virtualized data. And hopefully this is here. Okay. So one thing I wanted to actually show was, uh, so this is really cool here. Um, we have some new things in our project now. So I'll just flip through them really quickly. Uh, so we had our data refinery flow. This is the job that kind of defines when it's run, what it actually does. Um, and the output of that was actually the one that's uh, in, in the one that's titled with uh, underscore shaped. So that was the output of that. Um, and that one there won't have the, uh, the, the dropped column, if you recall. Now we have this random connection here. This is actually an artifact of uh, data virtualization. And then data virtualization actually kind of saved or at least references now both the retailers and the sales data that we virtualized. So now it's been virtualized and added to our project. And here we're going to actually create something called a view, which is where we actually join the, uh, the data here. So let's go ahead and hit join. And yeah, it's really cool here. I like this uh, interface um, where you'll be able to see the different columns that are available. And so say you want, um, but to actually proceed, you have to make sure that there's one kind of foreign key that maps to each other. And luckily we have that with a retailer code. Um, so again, we can, you know, we can drop some of the columns on here if we'd like. Um, let's do retailer code and maybe uh, uh, stale staff, or let's pick something like um, sales staff code and country code. And then we can keep the rest for the sales, um, the rest of the table in the sales, uh, in the sales database. And uh, there we go. So, 
and we can hit preview. Let's see what happens here. And then after this, I actually wanted to go and how are we for time? Because I would like to show one more thing if we can. I, I think we are very tight on time. So okay. this would be your last demo for today, Steve. <laughs> oh, no. Um, can, I, can I try to do it really quickly? <laughs> I, I, I really like ending with the Kafka SQL Stream Builder stuff. Um, at least let me let me uh, let me bring it up. Hold on. Yeah. Data virtualization is right there. Let's go to SQL Stream Builder, um, which we can access from here. Let's just log in really quick. Okay. Here's our, um, if you recall, going back to data virtualization, here's our kind of join where we have the country code, sales staff code, and then the rest of the stuff from the um from the sales bits let's go ahead and click next keep the defaults and we can actually add this to our project and we can call it a uh, join view now let's create that view and similarly you'll see it created oh it's not from the error there i think that's to do with the publish um publishing with the catalog but um you'll see the join view show up over here in just a minute well, probably a few minutes takes a little bit of time. But really quickly, let's take a look at SQL Stream Builder because I think this is a really cool tool for uh, Cloud Era and Cloud Era. So with SQL Stream Builder, you can define different tables, and uh, you know, especially when it comes to Kafka, um, it's basically see all the the stream of data kind of live. So here we've got our Kafka connector over here. Let's go ahead and take a look at. And we've got a sales. Let me see something really quick here. Let's see if we can do this. Waz is probably cursing me in the background there. No, um, oh, you can continue. <laughs> hold on. I have some dummy data over here. Let's see. Okay. So I've got a Kafka. I've, I've got a small Python application here that's going to be writing to a Kafka broker. And this is the dummy data that it's writing. It's meant to write out a bunch of sales data, uh, transactions. And if you see the table, my Kafka table, I've already defined this. And you can actually uh, really quick, uh, we won't actually use this one, but you can see it's automatically going to pick up the Kafka endpoint that I have in there, the topic name. And if you go to the bottom here, detect schema, actually detects it really quickly. It gets it all right. It's really cool from here. So you can see there's a country code, order number, retailer code, um, date, uh, really cool stuff. But we we already have this defined. So let's just go back in here. It's called Kafka sales. Let's do a select star from Kafka sales. Helps if I spell it correctly too. Let's execute that. And you should be able to see your data coming from my Python script over there in this view. Fingers crossed. Unless Fawaz has jinxed me. Let's see. Uh, it might take a few seconds here. And then I want to go back and check out the, uh, I'll check out one more thing. And there we go. You can see our, our results coming in here. Uh, this is our sales tra sales transactions coming in. Uh, it should match, you know, my, give, or my, give or take a few seconds here, what we saw there. And let's stop that really quickly. And a lot of, I'm not sure if folks have used this uh, IBM product before. It's called Data Stage, which has just been added to Cloud Factor Data. And with Data Stage, let's go over here under Projects. With Data Stage, uh, let's go to D Stage 4. You can actually view data that was published on the Kafka broker that is on Cloudera, if you recall from our from our Cloudera cluster, it's uh, the Kafka broker is on Cloudera. And we're publishing it from some random source to the broker, and now we're going to read it from uh, read it in Cloud Pack for data. So here's our Kafka service, and here let's pop open this one. I've already got the job defined. It's a very small job. We just have a single Kafka source and a peak, which is just basically like a debug. 
and let's go ahead and run it and fingers crossed that it works. And uh, one really cool aspect while this thing runs, it's gonna take about a minute. One really cool thing is uh, over here, you can actually uh, sync this data. Um, it, SQL Stream Builder uses Apache Flink under the covers. So you can both um, create table definitions as sources. Uh, in here, the Kafka is a source and the sync is just the, uh, the console. So we're not actually putting the data anywhere. We're just viewing it here. Uh, but really cool is that you can actually sync the data to another location. So you can sync it to, and I've tried this out, I've synced it to IBM Cloud Storage. And I believe DB2 support is coming very soon. Uh, but Postgres is also available. All right. Yep, so that's really right around the corner. I think mean, that's really cool. I'm glad you're able to show that, Steve. Real time, you know, real time streaming is one of the key, I think, growing and just in demand kind of use cases for streaming. So, yeah. And you can see here, um, sorry about the screen size here, but you can see we are actually able to see the Kafka messages that are on Cloudera on data states that is on Cloud Pack for Data, which is really cool because then you can add a whole bunch of different transformations at this point. Um, and there's more connectors there. Uh, you can decode, copy, filter, funnel, do whatever you want. Um, and yeah, that's uh, that's kind of the gist of it here. And there's our, we can view the virtualized data. And I think I've hit everything I want to hit, guys. This is, uh, I'm probably way over, but I'm glad I was able to hit everything here. And you are perfectly on time. We are right there. Right. <laughs> the demo so, smiled upon me today. Yes, certainly. So um, let's just summarize what we did, All right? So we talked about Cloud Pack for Data, Cloud Era, and then Steve showed you some really cool demos on how we connected Cloud Pack for Data and Cloud Era together. So uh, with no further delay, I'm gonna hand it off to Kummer. So Kummer, over to you for the useful resources and the closing for this amazing session. So let me grab that. All right. Thank you so much, Steve, Pavas, and Dave for this session. Thank you so much to the audience for your questions and the engagement. Don't forget to follow us. And even after this, if you have any questions related to what we presented regarding Cloud Era, Cloud Pack for Data, please don't forget to reach out to the speakers. So here are some useful resources. Uh, you can go to the link, and we will be sharing that in the chat as well. You can go to the link and explore these further. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you. Thank you so much, you everyone. So these are our contact details. You can uh, add us on LinkedIn or email us if you have any questions. And uh, do fill in the survey. Do let us know how uh, how we are doing today, how we did today. Actually, we're done with it. And hopefully it was an enlightening session for all of us here. Well, I certainly did enjoy it. So, so yeah. Yeah. Thanks, everyone, for joining. It's great working Thank with you. Thank so much, everyone. Bye-bye. Right. Thanks for all the questions. See you folks. Bye. All right. Amazing.